introduce uh, Professor Rao uh, Kamapati. Uh, Rao is a AAAI fellow, and AAAI, for those of you who don't know, is uh, the main professional organization for artificial intelligence, and the, being a fellow is the top honor in the field. But additionally, he is a former president of AAAI. Rao is known for significant contributions to the field, particularly around uh, planning and sequential decision making, and his uh, recently, he's uh, been studying large language models a great deal, and he has been quite vocal and present in multiple media outlets, um, major media outlets such as Bloomberg, uh, The Hill, and uh, many others on this topic, helping educate the public on what they can and cannot do. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rep. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, so, so this is a presentation on Sky. The idea is so important that I wanted to rehearse. And so I went cross country to New York and talked to 900 people from JP Morgan AI Summit and checked out whether the talk is working or not and debug it. So now it's ready for you. Um, so let's see. Uh, so uh, the, as you can see from <laughs> that earlier uh, part, um, one of the interesting things is everybody is an expert in AI. As I was walking <laughs> by, the more people became experts. Um, and, and so uh, as much as it might look kind of strange to have an AI day in sky, uh, that's sort of almost like man's day in engineering. Um, it, <laughs> I think it is worth understanding that the, uh, most of the technical background in AI is very much strongly centered in computing and sky, the school. And so it's very relevant that we are having this because it's sort of important to point out that as I tell my intro AI students, the demand for AI experts without any AI background has never been greater. Than <laughs> so so um, that's partly uh, something that I think is a useful thing that we are having this uh, great uh, sky um, AI day. Um, so even though I'm going to be talking more about elements and planning and reasoning um, about that, um, my own research program, uh, in addition to that, I'm also very much interested in human-AI interaction, how do you have uh, AI systems interact um, with humans the way humans interact with each other, and so that you can actually um, have a fluid interaction. And there's a large amount of work that we've done, including writing books, as well as, you know, tons of the several students graduating. And so if you're interested in that aspect of it, please do talk to me later. We also have like books on that. Okay. That's about the human AI interaction. Um, so let me set up the stage because I called the, okay, so a couple of people are coming. Please come in, guys. Um, come in. So let me set up the stage that, remember I, the, the title of my talk is, Can LLMs Reason and Plan? And you know, you kind of see that anybody ever says, can somebody do X and Y? The answer is typically, of course, not, right? Uh, because it looks like a skeptical uh, title. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is everybody loves LLMs. That if you are slightly skeptical about LLMs, it's like kicking puppies in front of people and they get <laughs> mad at you, right? And so I want to tell you that I'm here not to lament LLMs, but to leverage them, to understand what they can do so that you can use them in the right way. So a clear-eyed understanding on the strengths and limitations of a technology is a step towards advancing it, whereas blind cheerleading, art analyzed cynicism is just steps for your own influencer career. I don't have an influencer career. I'm just a researcher, so I'm more on the uh, first thing. So that's what you're going to get from me. Um, so anyway, in case you... Um, don't get the reference, that's of course Mark Anthony's speech and for now Mark Anthony. Okay, um, so I also want to say that much of what I'm going to say today, it's not just uh, some sort of a uh, newspaper article, this is backed by solid research. There are like three papers uh, with the students who haven't yet woken up, students who don't wake up in the mornings. Um, um, uh, that we will be presenting in New York, which is like, you know, considered 
essentially the ground zero uh, of uh, you know, all of these developments these days, um, including one of them on the planning units of large language models, uh, which is like a spotlight uh, presentation. Okay, so that's one thing that I'm going to tell you. The other thing is the general theme of this whole thing is LLMs are amazing, but they are amazing as a cognitive orthotic rather than an autonomous system that can do everything for you. So if anybody ever tells you that LLMs can be autonomous, try to remember this talk, this rainy early morning day and see why, whether or not you should take that with a lump of salt and salt. Okay, so that's actually uh, in addition to teaching, I also teach. So I write a lot of stuff on Twitter. So in case you're interested, you can follow me and Rob to see. But that's basically a couple of days back, um, you know, I think a week or so back, I was actually writing my thoughts and you know, what's the right way of looking at elements, um, you know, and that's, that's something that's come up. And in case you're thinking maybe it's just Rob or nobody else, that's Yang Le Kun, which I'm sure some of you have at least recognized, saying essentially this is the best way to actually use LLMs. Okay. Um, okay. And also, uh, in addition to this talk, there is also a tutorial, the house tutorial on this topic that if somebody, you know, the students involved are interested, they can watch that. Okay. Um, so, in general, so the foreshadowing the summary before going into the details is that. You know, they are essentially LLMs have this approximate omniscience because of the way they're trying to train, and that can make them give you some approximate answers to pretty much any kind of question. And that is a great thing. That's a way that's sort of ushering in a sort of a new resurgence of approximate knowledge-based AI systems. In fact, the word symbolic AI has sort of become has been you know connected with GoFi, the good old-fashioned AI. It's now currently, currently in fashion AI because LLMs essentially give you symbolic knowledge and that can be you know, um, built on top of. Uh, except there are no guarantees that the knowledge it gives you is actually correct. There's a temptation to confuse approximate retrieval capabilities of LLMs as if they're actually doing it by reasoning. And I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you would know for sure that yes, in fact, memory can be confused for reasoning. So if I ask you a tough question and you answer it, I'm impressed. And then you tell me, oh, somebody told me before coming into this room that I, you would ask me these questions, but they told me the answer. I will lose all my, you know, interest in a few, right? So that's basically what LLMs are doing because every possible, you know, the standardized exams, one of the things about standardized exams is that they also have standardized question banks. And they're all under them. And the people with their life don't necessarily need all the questions, but LLMs actually have access to all of them. And so that winds up allowing them to do approximate retrieval. Uh, LLMs can be used both as a, from the concept of planning and reasoning, which I'm going to talk a lot more about. Uh, they can be used as a source of planning knowledge uh, also to provide candidate plans, and also to develop domain models for planning, which then can be used by other sound planners. This is what's called the LLM modulo approach. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, you know, that's basically, in fact, the main question in this day and age for people interested in reasoning is if you have in your family a doddering old uncle uh, who is a noida, who basically has an answer to everything, but there's no guarantees that the answer they give is actually right. Could you have use for them? All of us actually do have use for those insufferable noidals. It turns out because once in a while we run out of ideas. In fact, there is such a thing as running out of ideas. And when you're running out of ideas, some friend is passing by and say, hey, can you give me an idea? And those guys have no stake in the work that you're doing. They'll give you an idea. Whether or not it's useful is something you are going to check. LLM has become this for all of us. And it's a great way to use it, but don't assume that the idea generation is the same as reasoning. You know, think of something like mathematics. Perma came up with an idea um, that, you know, of Perma's theorem, right? It should be it's called theorem, it's not in the conjecture. And Andrew Wiles spent 20 years of his life, a couple of centuries later, to actually prove it. There's a difference between idea and proof, and we need to understand both, especially in engineering departments, because robustness is very important. We want to, you can't just say, yeah, it's an idea, it may work, may not work. If you actually try it out on Bill Avenue, you might get one over, and you should keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, what are the elements? I mean, just in case somebody just come, you know, 
has never heard of LLMs, you know, which is very unlikely. Um, and so LLMs are essentially n-gram models on steroids. Given n previous work tokens, can you predict the next token? In terms of words, it will be given n previous words, can you predict the next word? This has been around in computer science and AI for forever. Uh, the difference is they used to use n small values of n, two gram models, three gram models, and so on. And what changed in the context of the chat GPTs of the world is n has become 3000 for GPT 3.5 and something like 8000 for GPT 4 and so on. Okay. And the moment it becomes 3000 words, that's just for chat GPT 3.5, um, that's a humongous amount of context. And so if you're trying to figure out how to actually um, keep this knowledge, you can really get it by statistics. So you look at the current statistics of 3000, when these 3000 words occurred, what was the number of times this word occurred? What's the number of times this other word occurred? And you just keep in track of this, uh, um, this probability table. So there's a little table, that's it, okay? The problem is this table is now going to be 50,000, so assuming that you're, Vocabulary is about 50,000 words in English. Each word can be 15,000 different words. So you have 3,000 words in the sequence. So you need 50,000 power 3,000 rows for this table. Even Elon Musk cannot have that kind of a storage, right? So what LLMs basically do is compress that table. A 50,000 power 3,000 table is compressed to be a much more approximate function. So when you hear about numbers like 176 billion parameters for ChatGPT 3.5, you are impressed, oh my God, it's such a big number. Compare that to 50,000 for 3,000. You ask Google, what is the answer to that? You say infinity. That's how big a number that is. So compared to that, you're getting like a steal. This is like a huge discount for you, okay? And it turns out that if you have any background in AI and you know, basically, Compression leads to some sort of generalization. Is that the right generalization? Nobody knows. If you compress, you wind up generalizing. Okay, so that's basically the kind of machine learning and you know, compression are hugely connected. So that's really the way to think about you know LLMs and uh, and you know transform architectures are used to actually learn this function. That's pretty much the main part that I want to think of. And of course, it's taken humongous, um, you know, uh, hold on public imagination, especially because of that. Uh, the fact that they consider every prompt, anything that you ask, it looks at it as the, you know, some number of words, and it basically starts reading the next word. No, in the current 3,000 word window, what would be the next word? And then when it's concept predicts, it just basically shifts the window, predicts the next word, and so on. That's what is happening. And in fact, none of you ever gave a 3,000 word prompt. The reason they have 3,000 word prompts or even 8,000 word prompts is because all these people write much longer pre-prompts before whatever you put in is even coming in. That's the one they say, please don't be um, <laughs> too um, offensive and don't call people names, et cetera, et cetera, and to the extent we can do. Okay, so and so they, there are lots of interesting things if you do in terms of any possible prompt, and people are impressed that the prompts are being completed and uh, in, in a pretty reasonable way. And part of it is because we here we have no intuitions about this high uh, context elements. We know n gram models for n equal to one and two. We have, um, you know, in, in, uh, you, you have. Uh, um, uh, some intuition about that, but for 3,000 you don't, and for 8,000 you certainly don't have. Okay. And so you basically, because you don't have intuition, you're actually very impressed that, wow, it's doing something very interesting. Um, now that's all about LLMs. I'm not going to belabor that. I'm sure very much all of you um, have tried the chat GPT once or twice, and you know, you're impressed sufficiently. Um, the thing that I'm interested in right now is can they reason? You know, so human intelligence is memory plus reason. To some extent. So we remember things. We have a non-veritical memory, just like LLMs actually, not like the database memory that Sensu does, but non-veritical in the sense it's just can kind of come, you know, constructing piece by piece by piece, which is why, by the way, human memories are highly you know, fallible and witnesses are not actually trusted because you reconstruct, you never remember an index and retrieve. So that's what LLMs do. And because they never actually 
exactly remember that looks like a repressive thing when you can't remember suddenly people think wow you told new stuff because if you do the turn it in there is no actual previous essay that exactly matches the essay you gave because you know the, the one that chat we did has wound up being in the same distribution but not is actually not an exact copy of any essay okay so that is the question but that part we know that it can do the question is can it reason and if it also can reason then suddenly you know you have ai complete uh, systems you know, if you can do from planning and you can do memory and reasoning you have AI complete so that gets me to can as well Okay. Um, a priori, there is no real reason based on what I just told you to even think that they can do reasoning because um, if you have any back, you know, some sort of a background on uh, the, the theories of uh, human intelligence, you do have this system one, system two metaphor, and system one is this um, um, the, the thing that the, the, the memory, the, the, the uh, things that you give answers to just you know, reflexively, and system two does the reasoning. And LLMs really should be seen as giant system ones. They have no system two. So there really is no reason for them to be able to do reasoning in the process. Can you answer questions that require reasoning without reasoning? Yes, if you remember the answer, you just say it. You understand what I'm saying? That's the thing that you have to understand. And if you understand that, a lot of things fall into place. Sometimes there may be like two different reasoning problems in a computing. We spend a lot of time on computational complexity. One reasoning problem is polynomial, another is exponential, the third one is semi-decidable. LLM takes the same couple of milliseconds to spit out the next token for all of them. And all of them are equally wrong or right. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no such thing as computational complexity guiding LLM's performance. So there's no reason to believe this. But, and in fact, people tend to kind of confuse approximate omniscient, um, which is the fact that they've been trained on every possible piece of data on, in, on the web that you and I put together on the web um, as, as, as science of reasoning. That was the whole deal about sparks of uh, AGI. Um, in particular, one of the things is none of you really know what's out there on the internet. You think you do. Okay, there are sites that explain jokes. There are sites that explain M movie endings. There are sites that explain everything, all sorts of things. And so, and if you don't know the fact that they exist, the fact that LLMs are able to act, explain a joke, which was a big deal when Palm, the Google's LLM came along, you will be very impressed, but you don't have to be that impressed because it actually has background data that it's able to do. Okay, um, and so in general, memory reduces the need to reason from first principles. And we know this, that's why we mark up before the exams. But thankfully, or unthankfully, or thankfully for the instructors and you know, bad for the students, they do have a life. So they can mark up every possible thing that ever been written on about that subject. So we can force them to reason during the exam. <laughs> understand what I'm saying? Um, whereas for elements, it's much harder to force them to reason because they have been trained on the entire web scale data. And to give this, put this in perspective, essentially, it, so it becomes hard to not be surprised that they're able to answer questions. Uh, so an example, that before I get into the planning part, let me point out that one of the abilities that elements can show is that they can decode cipher text. Cipher text basically is if you write something in, you know, sample uh, alphabet, then for you basically you know, replace every letter by that letter offset by some n. So uh, if it is starting with a and you are doing a cipher text of uh, rotation one, then you become b. So the stuff that comes out, you do it letter by letter change. This is called this is the ciphers, and you know it looks like gobbledygook, and LLMs can actually decode it back. You are extremely impressed. I thought that looks like it's pretty interesting thing, right? Some people actually have done a careful analysis and found that if you were to realize that it can, the offset can be between one to twenty-six, right? There are twenty-six letters in you know in the in the uh, alphabet, uh, and if you actually try different levels of ciphertext with one offset, two offset, three offset, thirteen offset, blah blah blah, and look at how good its performance is. Not, and you would be surprised to hear that it is actually good at the one, two, and thirteen. 
and nothing else. 5, 1, 2, and 30. Those of you who are too young probably do not know that, in fact, the usual silly way to do a uh, cipher test is rot 30. You shift everything by 30. And so there is enough data which has done um, 13 cipher text detecting. It only knows how to do 1, 2, and 30 because those are the things on the web. Okay? And you, if you are a little kid, if you explain to a little kid how to do the process, it will actually be, they will be able to do any level of cipher. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? And so if you did not hear what I just told you, the first time you check, it did the 13 cipher text, you would be very impressed. My God, it's doing this. Okay. Um, so even though I had no reason to believe that it can do planning uh, last year, one year back, you know, I could take people going on and on writing this paper saying they can do all this really exciting stuff. So I asked my students, okay, let's just do it, check. But you know, one of the things about checking is you need to do systematic analysis. You know, remember that astrology is still alive and well because people just do non-systematic analysis of effectiveness of something and say, it works for me, so much we astrology is right. The reason we know that astrology is a pseudoscience is every possible systematic study shows it to be basically ineffective. Okay, so what we did was we took 500 examples in very simple words like stacking blocks, are sending trucks from place to place, etc. 500 examples randomly generated and checked you know, what its plans are, and then you run those plans using a simulator, that basically for that domain. And if it actually is executed correctly, giving the goal, you get one point, otherwise you get ten points. This is how the real world works. When you say you have a plan, you should execute it and correct. Not like your father or mother say, yeah, that looks like a good plan, good boy. That's not the way the real world works, right? So it turns out that we found that actually it's really bad. Actually, it's like less than 10 percent accuracy. Okay, so at that time last year, uh, there was all this uh, news pick up, uh, you know, basically because if you say LLMs can do something, nobody is surprised because they expect them to do it. If they can't do something, they say, are you sure? Did you really check? Okay, and, and so anyway, there was some coverage of that, you know, basically that planning would not be doable, at least have GPT 3.5. Then came GPT 4. There were sparks. Sparks of AGI, what they are in GPT-4. So the question is, are those sparks helping it to solve the planning problems in this particular case? And so we actually did a pretty systematic study. This is actually part of the James paper that I showed you, uh, the Spotlight paper. So we did all sorts of different setups that people try. We try to you know use LLMs, different kinds of prompting techniques, and so on. And we found that it went from three to four percent. So you say, Rao, why did you waste your time in the morning? It went from 3 to 34 percent when it went from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4. By GPT 5, it will be, you know, 49 percent. For GPT 7, it will be 178 percent at least. Okay. What are you going to talk about? Well, the point is, um, the question then, is, anyway, there are these ways of you know, prompting it and you know, um, the actual answering it. And, you know, one of the other things is, you know, just to put this in perspective, uh, if you pay, Doctors on Amazon, little bucks, um, and ask them to solve the same problems, um, right? They get about 70% on the same problems, okay? Uh, and so GPT-4 is getting 30, 30%. But I'm more interested in checking whether they're actually able to do this. And one of the things about reasoning is the, the name of the predicate doesn't matter. You know, Shakespeare had something going when he said, a rose by any other name could smell as sweet, okay? So if you change the names of the predicates, it's the same domain and it should be able to solve the problem if it actually is doing reasoning, not retrieving. So on the other hand, if you're retrieving, it would fail. You see what I'm saying? So that's what we did. So this is the blocks world domain and we just change the words to make it either non you know, in this particular case, Picking up a block uh, becomes attacking an object, and setting a block becomes feasting an object, and so on and so forth. Okay, the point is, this is not the English meanings that you care about, it's how the predicates are connected. That's where the meaning comes from. And it, it is true that you know, humans will take a couple more minutes in solving these problems, but they will solve it because they do have a system. 
We try to solve everything in system one, and then when push comes to shove, we will shift the system. Four element has no system. So how will it do? Now surprisingly, it falls from 30% to 0.16%. 0.16%. For for essentially blocks word with just names change. Okay. Um, so that's where we are. And so when uh, people are very worried about uh, this whole rogue AI is going berserk and killing everybody because Satya basically poured all this money um, into OpenAI and uh, you know the GPT-4, I was tweeting in April that you know, afraid of GPT-4 going rogue and killing you all, worry not, planning has got your back because you just ask it to do you know, some blocks for stacking and you pay. I don't know how many of you are old enough to have seen something like war games, where at the end they stop the computer by making it play chess against each other. Uh, so here, this is the version of that. So obviously, come in chain. Um, so some of you who actually know more about you know LLM stuff and say, oh, well, you may have just tried the obvious one. Did you try chain of chain of you no know, um, uh, thought prompting? So which will be sort of like state tracking, or did you do fine chain? We did all of them. In fact, you read the new paper, we have tried every possible thing you could try to give the benefit of doubt to LLM. It reminds me of this joke of an English teacher who's trying to teach spelling to kids, and they say that if you get even one letter right, I'll give you full points. And please spell coffee. And the kid says K-A-U-G-H-I. That those of you who know English, realize K-A-U-G-H-I sort of can be phonetically coffee, but it obviously not even a single. Uh, let her correct. So we tried it, tried to give all possible benefits of doubt to LLM, um, including fine tuning, and it doesn't really help. And I do want to mention about fine tuning that what is fine tuning doing? If somebody doesn't know the answer to how to do reasoning, all fine tuning is doing is giving a huge number of worked out examples that will convert a reasoning problem into a retrieval problem locally. If it isn't already present, in the bed. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So fine tuning is actually a silly thing to add reasoning, but we tried that too, and it doesn't. It's not particularly effective. It's not like you learn the regularity after seeing a couple of examples. You do tell them so. Okay. Now comes the more interesting thing. Maybe the first answer LLM give is wrong, but they can self-critique and they can check their answer and improve the answer. This is something you guys do. Right, you sometimes come up with a plan and you look at it carefully. No, 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 this is not going to work. I'm also supposed to be here at nine, and I'm also trying to do something at uh, some other place at across the street, across the town at 847. It's not going to work. So you verify the plans you generate. And in general, in actually, uh, people fall for this because for our computationally, either for humans or for computers doing other this. Generation is typically harder computationally than verification. For this kind of plans that I'm looking at, generation is P-space complete, and, um, and, 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 and uh, verification is only polynomial. But remember what I told you about analytics. For a person who is just retrieving the answer, how hard was the answer to compute doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? If you basically, if I tell you the answer to a semi-decidable question and answer to a polynomial time question, you retrieve both of them in the same exact amount. Okay, so can the LLM self critique And this is like a current version of people trying to assume that they have the ability to do, um, you know, a reasoning. And we check that, and this is extremely new. It's like basically like more than just about three, four weeks back. Um, and then that really shows in this particular case, in fact, the next one will be about planning, but this was even a simpler problem. This is just a graph coloring problem. Essentially, color, you know, things such that no neighboring you know, vertices have the same color. So they're constrained satisfaction problem. And it turns out that if you ask it to just guess and you check whether the guess happens to be correct, it gets about 16, 17 percent. If you ask it to critique itself and then keep improving it, and then when it is ready, it gives the answer the outsiders check. What's how many of you are surprised? If you have no idea how to solve a problem, 
go with your first guess because your second guess in your answer is only going to push you under. You see what I'm saying? This is exactly what you would expect. You don't know this because you know how to solve the problem. It's just that you didn't know how to do the full search. Okay, so we were able to show this, and that was like a pretty big thing. Everybody was surprised again that wow, and do that. I mean, we are using that thing. How can it not work? Well, a little bit of collective delusion that goes on even also in research. It's the same sort of a problem occurs in planning. If you do this one, there's like two papers that are being presented in the units workshops uh, on foundation models for decision making, uh, as again as units the main campus, the other three papers being presented. So that's the stuff. Okay. Um, so I actually treated this, I think in October 21st, can I learn self critic and you know, I will put this point at the top. And of course, uh, uh, a lot of people who are very interested, but some of the people started pushing back saying, you being negative about LLMs. This is why I'm saying, if you say anything that they can't do something, it's like saying, puppy, I'm going to, you know, kick you. Okay, so I have to write this thing, say, look, look, I'm not an LLM that I, which I will tell you, I actually, they're very useful. As Kai was saying, they are great idea generators. And as long as you don't assume idea generation is the same as reasoning, you're okay. In fact, there's this great Fox Light joke I wish I put this here, which explains how Einstein got his equal to MC square equation. So he was trying equal to MC cube, MC power five, MC power seven. And then this cleaning lady comes in, cleans up the table and says, now it's all square, it's all square. That's <laughs> And if you're laughing at me, ask yourself, if you ask any mathematician or any inventor, when did you get your great idea? They never say, I was working in the office and the idea came. It will always be there in the toilet or the running or something and the idea comes. But the idea is not enough. The reason you are actually giving them the benefit of doubt, I mean, giving them their prestige, the, 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 the fame that they get is because they didn't just stop with the ideas. ideas we can also get ideas. You know, sometimes we run out of ideas, but we can also generate ideas. The big thing is they're able to prove that. That's very important. Okay. So um, basically, I said that. And once again, um, that basically, you know, it, it, like Jan Le Kuhn, it's basically things similar ways in terms of reasoning capabilities are balanced. Now you might say, giving answers, I might kind of improve their correctness by just giving them little bit of things. This is how teachers, especially the good teachers, not the you know mean ones like we do, uh, you know, sort of help the students. They'll give an answer. They say, oh, right? Why didn't you consider doing this? Why didn't you consider doing this? Basically, giving them the answer to see if they get to the answer. Right? It's a great way to teach for humans, but the teacher never thinks that the student completely solves the problem. The teacher realizes that I basically help the students solve the problem. When they do it with the uh, machines, however, people tend to assume when they give these hints, they think they assume they forget the importance of the hints they give, and they assume that the machine actually solved it up, like the LLM solved it up. Like and so there is this whole notion, there is this problem called the clever hands effect. Unfortunately, you can't see the picture. How many of you heard of clever hands the hearts? Oh my god, okay. <laughs> because you're next to my office, my friend. <laughs> so clever hands is uh, this uh, this chat GPT hard graphic sign, you know, from um, uh, fr from in, in Europe, um, which could do arithmetic. So if you say seven plus four, it will stomp its hoof, exact number of times, eleven number, right? And four plus nine, stomp that in. So this is such an amazing half that the clever hands and its uh, inventor, <laughs> um, it, it, its uh, owner. To, you know, went around Europe trying to give these great demonstrations. So it's like the chat GPT has of its time. Why don't you actually have that anymore? Because people did careful analysis and found that what the horse was sensing is the tension in the owner. So if you say, this is like if you are with your kid in the classroom and the student, is, the, the kid is being asked questions for the teacher, if the kid is making mistakes, you get tense. This four hours is this owner's kid, right? So you say 10 plus four, the heart will start stomping. When it comes to 10, his tension is increasing. So hearts recognize that and will start approximately. 
So what it knew was not arithmetic, but how to get, how to sense the tension. This much we know that dogs and animals can sense tension in people. So unfortunately, it did pass GRE or SAT, it didn't go to school, nothing, and we should give up on it, right? Um, so, but, so the point about chat GPT, um, doing, and the humans giving answers is basically you may actually be giving the solution without to recognize it. Chat GPT is, uh, I'm sorry, that clever hands owner was not deliberately trying to mislead anybody. They just didn't even know that they're giving him the answer. And that, in fact, it's not doing arithmetic, it's actually sensing the thing, okay? Um, which is why I came up with this picture, which I hope you will remember. It's like my biggest contribution to science as of now, because it's kind of, you know, quoted all over the Twitter. You know, you'll see this everywhere, it's just mine. I mean, this picture is not mine. Those two things are mine. Um, essentially, the impressive reasoning abilities of LLMs all depend on the problem doing that. If you don't, if the prompter doesn't know the answer, then they don't know when to stop giving this feedback. And so the really it's like teacher helping the student along. If you are in the cases where you can either know the answer or you can tell whether or not the answer is the right one. Like for example, you're writing an essay, you ask chat to write an essay, you look at the essay and then I'll try this again, try this again, and then I thought, but I'm happy, that's okay. If on the other hand, if on the other hand, you are asking ChatGPT, um, what is factorial 79? And you don't know, and you don't have a calculator. Like, it, you don't know when to stop. If you don't know the answer, or similarly, you know, what is the capital of some country and you are not Googling it, it will keep coming up with stuff, but that's not guaranteed to give you any five answer. So this is extremely important to understand that if you don't know the answer, then you basically get anywhere. So this is the another joke that I wrote, uh, a joke abstract I wrote, forest of jumbo thought prompting an ultra general way to use elements for solving, planning, reasoning, world peace, and climate change tasks. <laughs> you would think people will see that it's made up, right? I got more requests for that paper than the real papers. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you how much of people want to believe that elements can do everything. They're amazing, but they don't do something that you have to keep in mind. So in fact, I love this stuff that we prove by deduction to, I mean, you should read this, I mean, it's one of my better creations. We prove by deduction to Luke Goldberg machines that the forest of jungle without prompting eventually makes LLM solve any problem, solve any problem for which the prompting graduate students know the answer. Because these papers are all written up, maybe, by, you know that research is not done by old folks, it's done by PhD students. And if they know the answer, they keep, they don't keep on, they'll keep prompting it until they get the right answer. <laughs> right? So what you really know is how much of knowledge you are about as So it's sort of a way that you shape your company is sort of a thing that the more you know the, the real thing, the funnier it gets. The more you know the real thing about how LLMs are being used for quote unquote reasoning tasks, the funnier it gets. So um, a small paper called New York Times asked me about ChatGPT and all the stuff. They were just you know, once in a while they called me. And so uh, they wrote this up. And then one, like, apparently, people were very impressed that with that particular quote that they took, it became the quote of the day. So I, as far as I'm concerned, honestly, I think retired. I'm done. Okay, because I already have quote of the day in New York Times. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but uh, so if you don't know an answer to the question already, I would not give the question to one of these. This is what I said. And and it began to You say, I don't know. Okay, so for all, this is said by the guy who heads Palm, Anna Bombard, the current LLM um, team of uh, Google. Okay, and but basically, he said it like five months later, slightly slower. But uh, that uh, essentially, I won't ask Bard any question for which I don't know that. This is not bad, by the way. It is only bad if you expected miracles. If you expected the horse to be flying, you would be always disappointed with the horse. Okay, if you expected a horse to you know run well, you would be very impressed with the horse. So don't expect, you know, don't you know ascribe fake things. So again, if you look at it that way, the prompter knowing the answer becomes very important. So that basically actually uh, Matthew, stand up. So Matthew is he woke up, so he should be made to stand up. So he's that guy. No, he and uh, Kapti, who normally wakes up only at 2.30 uh, because he's been working the whole night. Um, and um, and another former um, student, basically are the authors uh, on this paper um, in Nepal.
happen. But uh, we also provided a plan benchmark, which other people can use to actually check. In fact, they can do it better. You know, and, and so those both are papers. So it looks like I've shown that LMs cannot do planning in autonomous modes. That's pretty much what I'm showing, that they by themselves cannot do planning. Okay. Um, so, uh, and in fact, I think several people agree. They might have, this has become like a, one of the slides that Jan uses in his talks on LLMs, which basically talks about the oldest paper that we wrote one year back about, you know, they can't plan. And they still can't plan, even after one year. However, the literature is full of papers that say they can plan, that they, that say they can reason. Now, this is actually interesting for those of you who aren't keeping up with science. You know that science is one step, two steps forward, one step back. It's always that. It's only after all the science is over, you make this nice monotonic progression of ideas, etc. You know, the ether anybody? Not the ethernet either. The whole entire physics was all written with ether, which is required for light to you know go in. And there were papers written on it, and it was you know seeing it everywhere. And so the question is, why are these people writing these papers? And uh, why this divide? I want you to understand that too, because that's important. Because you kind of, you know, you don't, you know, my thing is, don't attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by ignorance. <laughs> right? These people are, you know, neither the chat GPT, neither the clever hands guy, not the people writing these papers, or being publishing units, etc., are deliberately out to deceive people. They are not. They may themselves not be able to realize, just like the clever hands guy, that they're actually giving you the answer. Okay, so to understand why this is possible error can come, think about what planning generally involves. Planning involves planning knowledge, actions, preconditions, effects, general recipes. How do you take a big task split into smaller pieces? Um, old examples, you know, for this plan, you know, people tend to use this kind of recipe, so I just use that plan and try to tweak it. All of this is background knowledge about plans. And then plan generation or verification technique, which is you put these things together and make sure that they work together correctly without interactions. If you don't do the second step, you only have thing, a plan that looks like a plan, but that doesn't actually work. And what happens is elements are great at this approximately, they suck at this. This one requires search, this one requires memory. In fact, in the current AI systems, the DAI, LLM AI systems, the recipes, actions, preconditions, etc., are written by humans. They will provide these models. Now, LLMs essentially can get all the stuff that all humans have written on the web, not just for this task, and they are able to get approximate knowledge relevant to the task. But then making sure that it works together correctly is something they can't do. Okay? So if you contrast it, they are planning, as I said, planning in general assumes that the model is given and it focuses on the interaction solution. Okay, um, and so LLM trained as there on everything that they have put on the web have kind of an approximate ambitions. This helps them spit out actions with these uh, they, they approximately. In fact, those of you grad students who know of things like Voyager, etc., that's pretty much the reason why it sort of works. It spits out approximate uh, recipes, and somebody has to make sure that the com combination works better. If not, the plan won't work. So, in fact, we check this by taking the same planning problems and removing the interactions, the way things get into each other's nerves in planning is one action requires a precondition that another action deletes. So because of which you can't do this action, right? So if I take the same blocks of domain and remove all the delete effects so that everybody can get along who buy a life, right? Then there should be fewer on plans. And not surprisingly, LLMs do the green part has increased as to relax the domain more and more. Okay. However, notice they still read even in the best cases. That's because LLMs can't even count. If there are five goals, you need at least five. Make sure that all five goals are supported by actions. They can't do that. So once in a while, that also can go down. But you can still see that this is a much simpler kind of thing. Okay. So then, how come LLMs are being compared as doing planning? Most cases when LLMs are claimed to generate executable plans, on closer examination, turn out many cases where LLMs are just getting by with generate approximate recipes. If either your domain is simple enough that just combining recipes will sort of work, or you have um, 
By the way, that's Scott thing who actually woke up in the first paper on the paper I was talking to you about. Uh, you know, what's the point in doing this talk unless I put them on the short? Right? Um, so either, uh, if you either basically don't have, you have a very weak uh, requirement of correctness, or you don't know, uh, or basically the domain is too simple that pretty much any possible combination of them is in work. Right? LLMs are good. If not, they will fail. And so what people do is they get by with high level plans and either depend on external simulators or verifiers or humans to correct the plans or hope that nobody is paying attention. Until we actually check the 500 blocks old plans, that's exactly what was happening. You will go sit with the chat GPT, you'll ask it to stack blocks, it makes a mistake, you say, you know, this other way, and if that's it, then you are happy to say chat GPT can do plan. You did plan. Okay. Um, when I gave 500 and I basically stood outside the room, it fails, which is essentially the ability to do reasoning. Um, that's important. Okay. So it's been, they tend to buy it off to human prompters, uh, basically put it on the web. Okay, so in fact, these some of these uh, systems which are actually pretty well cited. Um, again, that sort of tells you that science is two steps forward, one step back. This is the big science is. Um, so React in a monologue uh, essentially are dependent on retrieving recipes and hoping that putting them together will work. Many a time they don't work. Sometimes they kind of work because the domain is easy. You know where things kind of seem to work in cooking plants. You kind of consider this idea, that idea, and if you can kind of you know, hold your nose, everything is eatable. And same with essays. There is no such thing as a correct essay on the cow that I have seen in my entire life. Because I use the word cow because entire India high school system is writing an essay on cow. And for some reason, has elementary school system. So it turns out that any damn essay on cow is an okay essay on cow. LLMs are great at that. If there's only one solution, which is most of the case, the reason when you do search, for example, are reasoning, you know, and, and then they are not actually good. This is travel plans. You know, New York Times had an article about this a um, couple of months back um, about how LLMs basically on, on the and the New York Times. Um, um, so on, on Amazon, people are basically finding that there are a lot more travel planning books, not just the ones written by party daddies like Rick Steves. Because everybody figured out that ChatGPT can write plans and Tally can make pictures. So you make a digital copy of some random thing, and some unsuspecting person compares Rick Steve's $29.95. This one only $19.95. I'll go with this. So they'll buy this, they'll go all the way to Europe, they'll go to the museum and find that it's not open on the day they go. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Now that there is basically these sort of logistic issues fail, and so it's actually a pretty bad travel book. So all of them are returning them to you know, uh, Amazon. If their trip ended in 30 days, they get a refund. Otherwise, these guys are not good. This is a natural article. I'm not making this up. Okay, that tells you when you say, "Oh, ChatGPT can do travel plans." Yes, ChatGPT, by the way, can also do wedding plans. Please don't get married with that plan. <laughs> because you will find that certain things are missing at the certain critical times. And it's not enough to say, I got married, it's just that the bride wasn't there and the groom wasn't there at the right time. <laughs> and then a couple of rings were missing. But on the whole, the stuff was kind of right. I can give a look see and it looked like a wedding plan. That's what we do when we look at plans in text. Okay, somebody has to mind the boring stuff, the logistics, the scheduling. Right? Otherwise, the rest of us are all in this lala land about high level thinking, trains don't move. Okay? And so that's basically important to keep that in mind. Now, um, now for the positive part. So all this while I basically told you what they can't do. But idea generators are useful if you know how to use them right. So I'll tell you all the positive parts. Now, that's also part of our work. Um, that's why I was saying that I'm, I'm, I'm here to leverage LLMs, not to leverage them, even though first parts seem to be some of the relevant. Okay. Um, so one idea is to use LLMs as a generator for plan idea, and then let a planner with a sound model, uh, you know, basically correct. So in fact, there are planners which will basically, for blocks or whatever, they can 
take a in initial plan, they the way they search is they guess a plan, try to improve it by removing the flaws in the plan. This is local search. Okay. So what we do is we use the same idea. The language model suggests a plan, and the planner, which actually can tell truth from falsity. It could be you, but it actually is an automated planner. And you have a life, automated planner doesn't have a life, so it can actually start from this heuristic uh, that was given to try to improve its characters. And you can actually show that, in fact, in some cases, that improves the performance, the speed of generation of the plan for, uh, for the, uh, the sound plan. Because one of the nice things is the plans that the language model will suggest, even though they are not guaranteed to be correct, they're likely to be in the form that is what people have written plans about. So they, for example, never would give a wedding plan that would involve exchanging uh, rings way in the very beginning of the plan. They won't make that mistake. You know what I'm saying? So if you use that, then essentially LPG you can get a plan that's somewhat more closer to being correct, and it makes sure that the pieces work correct. And that actually improves performance. And it turns out that there's an old idea, and part of the reason I bring this up is it's not one or the other. There is no such thing as new AI and old AI. It's all AI. Okay. The older idea was this thing called case-based planning, where you have a case of old. Uh, plan and the, the storage of old plans, and then when a new problem comes, you try to retrieve some relevant case and try to improve it. Lawyers were all excited about it because the entire legal profession is case based, except the word case there is actual legal case. And so, in fact, they have used that in, in that too. But in general, um, the case based planning basically will have a store of cases that somebody has to actually construct. LLM has already been trained. If you have to train LLM just for your planner, you'd pay way too much money. But Sam Altman already paid. Satya actually you know, gave the money to Sam Altman so to train the GPT-4. So you get it for pennies. And so you can essentially, it essentially generates a case that's kind of relevant and then LPD types. And that winds up being a very useful idea. A much better idea turns out to be that writing a planner from scratch that is actually sound and it can actually run and correct the plans is harder than writing a verify. Remember, this is again about algorithms. In algorithmic complexity, verification is much cheaper than writing of generation. For LLMs, no such thing. So what we could do is let the language model uh, come up with a plan, and that plan, you know, instead of going to uh, LLM, I'm sorry, uh, not going to LLM. Yeah, uh, instead of going to LLM, it actually, show it here, it, it actually, the plan um, that LLM gives, the verifier, the verifier doesn't know how to generate plan, it only knows how to cut into well, to check whether the plan is correct or not. And if in fact there's some precondition of being violated. So you can check, yes, you're done, or try again, or try again the following precondition of not supported. And these are criticisms that the plan, the, the verifier is automatically giving. And those with those criticisms, Essentially, um, you can, uh, uh, this is basically the external verification. With those criticism, in fact, some number of iterations later, the verifier says, yes, you're right. And then you're done. And so, in fact, we find that with about 15 iterations, the LLM will be able to guess the plan correct. And if you are just about to say, then Ra, why are you yelling at LLMs? Remember that other slide I showed you when it tried to self it without any external verifier, it was it because it doesn't know good plan from bad plan. The important thing is the verifier, which actually checked that this one is a correct plan. And because of which, we can, you know, 15 generations, we can do that. Um, you can also have LLMs assisting human planners. That's a very useful thing, where in some sense, human becomes the external verifier. If, you know, it's just that they have more of a life and so they may not be able to do multiple iterations, but they can do that. And at that point, they realize it's just a technique that is helping them rather than just doing the planning itself. And it actually points up being used. Um, in general, criticizing LLM plans with external verifiers is a great idea, and but there are variations 
If you have an external model based verifier doing the taking, which is the kind of thing that we have talked about, they can actually provide not just as a plan is on, but here is where it is on. And that use that information may be useful for the LLN in coming up with the next. Yes, we have no real reason to believe that it will be, but you know, it's just it's part of the problem now. Okay. Um, and then uh, critiques those can be sound but not complete, and that will be okay. So you can have like a big plan that LLN is generating and multiple different critiques look at it from the point of view of okay, do the are the logistics of cars ready, are the logistics of bride and groom being present at the time of wedding ready, etc. And each of them check out yes, 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 and then the plan is they will say we have no more questions. And let's remember the whole entire wedding is if you have uh, any any question, bring it up now, otherwise keep your mouth shut. That's for the attendees, but now these are the critics who basically say it looks like it's a good plan. How do you think real world planning gets done? You know, when NASA sends stuff into space, like the whole bunch of different experts check that the plan is correct with respect to their constraints. That's better than all of them also being wrong, but that still can lead you to leave you with things like the owning disaster from the challenge. That's real world planning. Okay, so that basically you can do critiques can be sound and it's not complete and a series of critiques and actually be looking at the plan that is generated by LLM. And one of the nice things is LLMs essentially can guess a plan irrespective of how quote unquote computationally hard that particular planning problem is. Does it have continuous quantities? Does it have durative actions? Does it have stochasticity? None of that matters. It's just against. And the critiques then can look to see whether or not their constraints are there. And that's a very useful way of using it. Feedback from the world is another thing that actually things like Voyager say they use, but really they're using simulators. Because simulator is like a model world that you fail, you fail. In fact, you can get stuck in a ditch and, and then you can't come out. That's the whole notion of ergodicity. Um, of the world, ergodicity for one, you know, for those of you who don't know the jargon, is that the probability of going from one state to another state in the state space is always positive. That means you can reach any state in another state. You know, real world is not ergodic because death, right? And also getting stuck in ditches, things of that kind. Okay. Um, so it turns out feedback from the world doesn't really work as well because in fact, LLM can get stuck. You know, if the agent is using LLM plan, it can get stuck. And then at that point, you know, you have to restart somehow. LLMs verifying their own plans, I hope you remember that that doesn't work because they don't actually know. They will be happily running over the correct guess to come up with the wrong guess. And so they take the long Um, uh, One of the things about uh, fine tuning is can you actually make LLMs do verification better than generation? Upfront, there isn't any reason, but if you are trying to fine tune, you could potentially fine tune the generation part separately from the verification part. We have done some preview really work that shows that that can actually improve the verification accuracy a little more for the, because of the fine tuning. In that case, the verifier will probably can help. In this particular case, essentially, um, the idea is that we're doing the find the verification turns out to be what's called a discriminating task. You know, we've been talking all about generative AI, verification turns out to be discriminative task, and it turns out not normally to have lesser you know, sample data. LLMs for extracting planning knowledge is probably the most useful way to use them, as essentially that, you know, one of the things we do, this is another of my students who hasn't yet at all woken up, you know, uh, Lynn Guan, and also Karthik is another student who's involved in this. This often in this paper, instead of asking it for the Maxwell plans, you ask it for the Maxwell domain and correct it. And then let the planners use this corrected domain to actually check whether the LLMs guesses are correct. The interesting thing is they guess anything, they can guess the plan, they can get the planning domain too. They can guess the planning domain too. And so you can actually get the uh, PDDL, which is basically the domain knowledge, as uh, it's normally written in the form for these planners. You can actually, you know. Tease that out by asking LLMs a series of questions, and then the human and the critics are involved, they can actually. And once they are happy, that becomes the model that then the model based planner can use in two different forms. One is, of course, the just given to maximum domain independent planner, or the other is use my verification technique, back prompting technique, where essentially LLM guesses and the verifier using the domain model check whether it's correct. 
And I actually like this much better because it has that advantage that you're using LLM a lot more in terms of testing the plans too. Okay. One thing to remember is that it's the, the role played by the human has changed. In the beginning, uh, they're just checking whether or not a plan is correct. If for individual plans, they try to give prompts to correct it. Now they just correct the domain model once and they go home and sleep. And the planner can use the domain. It's a much better way of using uh, knowing other things, right? Um, so, so that exactly again that shows that this kind of an empirical empirical will show that that can be actually a very useful um, way of using them. You might say it is a new Um, That's the paper. Um, one interesting thing that I want you to think about, especially for those of you who are alive when the quote unquote expert systems era existed, is that the quote unquote good old fashioned AI essentially was going to the expert, asking for the domain knowledge, a knowledge engineer, a human knowledge engineer goes to the expert, asks for the domain knowledge, writes the domain knowledge in a formal fashion, and then gives it to a, um, gives it to a, um, a reason. Okay? What I just showed you in the previous paper is this whole process, LLM does it approximately. You understand what I'm saying? Because all possible knowledge of the world is in some blurred form already in the LLMs. And, and so you can essentially tease out the model correctly. And once you have a corrected model, you can actually do the plan. And this is actually a very interesting way in which the good old fashioned AI and the new kid on the block can complement each other. Because essentially, the model acquisition is something that LLMs can help you in general. Okay, um, much before this happened, like last year, I mean, when the only in AI can you say much before and say last year. So in last year, uh, Lynn actually also wrote a paper uh, in ICML, which basically said, look, if you take a deep reinforcement learning system, these are silly systems which try to, this is this, Rich Sutton has this thing about, um, you know, bitter truth business that we don't want to take any information from humans. And so they try to learn everything from very low level primitives, maybe, you know, by actually pixel level description of the knowledge of the world with actions in that. And they tend to be extremely slow. They guarantee to eventually converge, but they tend to be extremely, extremely slow. So the idea we had was suppose I gave you a PDL model that may be in fact, and it may definitely probably in country. Can that somehow help the deep reinforcement learner? It turns out it does because it gives you some approximate guidance and that improves the reinforcement learning much and, and it becomes much faster. You know, um, so this was an ICML paper too. And the interesting thing is this incomplete model Lynn had to write for his case. LLMs will provide incomplete models happening. Incomplete non-guaranteed models are what LLMs are made for. Right? And then you can then use this deep reinforcement learner with the simulator, which basically the sound reasoner, it then gets speeded up quite significantly because of this. So that's the way you should be using it. So those of you again, the grad students here, you may have heard of code as hierarchical policies. That's essentially what it's doing. You know, the code is the recipe or the domain knowledge that essentially the LLM writes. And one slight difference is for Python code, there is Python incremental interpreters. And so at least the syntactic errors are checked by the interpreter. And after that, there can still be errors. And those are unfortunately logical errors. And then those you would then do in the you know, verification form. In many of these cases, they will depend on an external simulator. So I would argue that this work, um, I would argue that this work is basically this work which is treated right now. Because they, both of them are using approximate models and a sound very a sound simulator based RL system outside. Okay. Finally, LLMs can also be used for format change. In fact, I would argue that general planning knowledge is in textual form and you convert it into PTT and domain models, such a format change of large knowledge. And similarly, general knowledge might be in textual form. You are very interested if it speaks out Python, that's format change. In fact, LLMs are extremely good at Python format, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, format chain. In fact, my way of checking whether there is an LLM on the other side is if it ever says, okay, I, this is the answer, but if you want it, I am very better with the humans. I know it's not human. Right? Humans can never do that. And in fact, people have found that one of the funnier things is 
Human subject studies are done oftentimes on the mechanical Turks, the Amazon mechanical Turks. These are poorly paid workers, mostly in India and Vietnam, etc. for a long time, who get done to do this work for pennies, and you get to kind of say we are working with human subjects. But ChatGPT has gone there too. So instead of they answering your question and you're hoping that that will tell you what humans will say to this question, they are giving these questions to ChatGPT, which will then tell them what to say, and then they give this to you. And a friend of mine tweeted the other day that I know I was talking to this uh, one of these ChatGPT things because the doctor said, here is the answer, but if you want a 100 word version, here is the answer. My entire life, I could never summarize, as you can tell from this talk already. Um, I could never summarize it. Right, you could do a hundred word version like that. That's the kind of thing LLMs are amazingly good at. It's not guaranteed to be correct, but redoing and summarizing is something that they're good at. For those of you who know think about retrieval augmented generation rags, all that really is is essentially the, the rag store in actual database of real text, but it just has been indexed in the vector form that is in the same embeddings that LLMs are found. And so it basically takes that piece of whenever you give a prompt, you throws the prompt to the database uh, that sets you put, you know, optimize, and then a bunch of the best hits, you just throw it on the top of the prompt and LLM summarizes it. You know what else can do that? Google. So if you actually just call Google and then summarize, that was what Bing Chat was trying to do originally. Okay. It's a useful thing because we just don't want to click on things. We want things written in some you know, connected fashion um, and we are likely to take a hit for that. And so RAG essentially is basically doing search engines. And if I were to do search engines course now, that's what I would do because I would always write things in LLMs. Okay. Uh, so the LLMs for format change is actually local very easily. We have, for example, looked at text plans and converted into formal uh, representations so that they can be usable by planners like case based planners, etc. For example, how do reasoning over them? This was something that we had done like three years back before this was all the thing. And many a time people tend to think that's the only useful for useful way of using LLM, but that's just a poor man's, a poor woman's way of using LLM. It's like saying, I'll say put on a B in English, it will write put bracket begin A, comma, B, and then bracket end. That's like essentially having a huge technical, you know, a hugely powerful system to do little pieces, like adding one plus one another. Instead, you should do the kind of things that I was suggesting. Okay, take a look, which you thought will never come. Um, there is a, these are the summary of roles uh, uh, that LLMs can play in planning. If they can just do plans autonomously, it's in red. I hope you'll remember that there is basically a bad idea. You know, unless if your life depends on it, don't do it. Okay, LLMs can generate plans with the help of external planners verifiers. This is what I call LLM modulo approaches. This is sort of like SAP modular approaches. Basically, external reasoners help the existing LLM in making sure that you know, reasoning actually happens. They can also be used to extract planning knowledge, which can then run the sound planners upside. And they can also be used as translators. This is like sort of a not a great thing to do. It's just, People have written papers on this, unfortunately, because they want to say we use the LLMs. Right? So they take their entire normal paper and just say LLM just takes put on AB and writes put, you know, parenthesis AB. Now we have used LLM. I mean, I'm not that bad with LLMs. I think they're extremely useful. You should just know how to use them, right? Okay. Um, in general, sequential decision making or planning in the era of LLMs essentially is, as I said multiple times, if you have been given a doddering old uncle who can, who is a know it all old uncle, who can give, and if you like aunts, aunts is fine, um, and who can give you approximate answers to everything with no guarantees, can you improve? Can you leverage them? And I gave you ideas about how to leverage them. And it turns out one of the ideas that is actually the old, the, the recent idea that is at, at the biggest worry about this use uh, of LLMs is deep reinforcement learning. Because they try to do this silly thing of trying to go back to the first principles. Nobody ever does anything from first principles. And LLMs actually give you more or less approximately how people have done that. 
And that essentially is why Voyager was on New York Times, although we've been getting to any paper from the actual conference yet. It was on New York Times because essentially Voyager is this NVIDIA system, it essentially gets planned recipes in Python code form and then runs it on the simulator. That's the best way to understand. Okay, so it turns out we, many years before we all started, I was interested in this idea about model like planning. If you have incomplete models, can you improve? How do you get robust performance out of it? This is a classical problem in general, robust decision making, and those become very important in the era of LLS. This is what I call model like planning, and I think we will do. In summary, you know, I, this is something that I already told you. Um, I'm not going to be labeled. And these are the students. Uh, that's um, you know, Sharad actually graduated in Colorado State, the professor himself. Kaya is the latest student, and um, Lynn and Matthew, in fact, uh, Lynn is not awake, but uh, so there. So you can answer the real tough questions there. And then the last going away thing thought is this is not a negative thought, this is a positive thought. If you think it's negative, it's because you expected the horses to fly and you are very disappointed that they're not flying. You should be impressed that the horses can run so damn fast. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So, LLMs have enough amazing approximate retrieval abilities that we can gainfully leverage. That's what I was telling you how to do. That we don't need to ascribe fake reasoning, planning, etc. capabilities to them. Even though the most Money making headline for a New York paper is LLMs are zero shot access. And then basically take any random problem and say it seems to work. And in fact, one of the problems with this, as I said, is AI in the era of LLMs has become as such natural science. It's like a zoologist finding a particularly new uh, animal, trying to figure out what it does while poking it and seeing. The problem is we are bad zoologists. We are bad uh, at statistical. Guarantee checking statistically rigorous tests. So we tend to go by uh, anecdotal evidence. That's not that, that's why you tend to think, well, it worked for me. And so then as I said, astrology works for lots of people, which is why it's you know, data and alive. Um, so no illusions that whatever I said will actually survive the hype, but I will come up to keep this. Thank you for your uh, patience and the any questions that I have. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah. So, uh, going back to the paper on graph coloring, uh, uh -huh. there was, uh, the title was uh, iterative prompting on uh, reasoning. But uh, by giving prompts, uh, aren't you like that name could be a bit misleading because by giving prompts, Aren't you converting a reasoning problem into a sort of a database? No, the only iteration that was going on is try again. Or try again, the following thing is wrong. That's it. Which is basically a reasonable thing to do. You know, you say, I know how to get the right answer. If you get it in the first try, it is great. But if you get it in the third try, that's not too bad. In fact, I had a great um, um, colleague many years back when I joined who said she used to understand the course and its entire contents two weeks after the final exam. In the grand scheme of things, that's amazing. That person is amazingly smart. Most people go through their life not understanding it. She understood two weeks after the final exam. So her grades were bad, but she did understand. So if it actually does give you the correct answer after a couple of prompts, where the prompts are only saying try again, you want to see. It. That's all I was thinking. Uh, but uh, my question is, uh, aren't you decreasing the amount of reasoning that the no, LLM is reasoning? I never thought they're doing reasoning. You think they're doing reasoning. So it's like saying, aren't you decreasing the amount of flying that horses are doing? I'm saying they never fly. It's just the question is, how do I use a fast running horse to do the stuff that I want done? Okay. Other questions? Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you. You made a great uh, case for uh, LLMs not being able to reason and plan it perfectly. Uh, that is uh, at the point a lot. So what about human beings? Are they able to reason? You can yeah, so that's a very interesting point that humans have systems. 
So he's actually first of all two different issues. One is people, when you say that LLMs can do something, such as LLMs can produce tickle code for generating a unicorn, you are happy to celebrate that. Have you ever seen a human being who can produce tickle code for unicorns on the street? No, but you don't care about the fact that it's superhuman there. But anytime you show that LLMs can't do something, you say, maybe humans can't do it either. I'm not talking about it. In general, that is a thing. So first keep that in mind. The second thing is, yes, humans tend to come up with the wrong plans, but they can actually verify. Do you understand what I'm saying? And by the way, humans are the ones who came up with the sound planners, so flowers. Right? We made planners, we made the other things. Yeah, and so it's a question of I think the distinction between coming up with the planner and the, the, the uh, I mean, operating them. I think, no, I think, I think, I think, I think the point is that that's part of the point that, like, for example, in blocks world for the talkers, for the blocks world, it's only 70% accuracy. You think, you know, they should do 100%. But, you know, all sorts of other things like, you know, I don't know why the heck am I doing this problem 18,000 times, etc. can come into play. It's a relevant question. So if you are essentially trying to, you know, replace not like the impatient humans uh, with LLMs, I would still ask because LLMs don't have feelings. We can actually tell them they're wrong and we can improve their robustness. And with humans, there are only so many times you can repeat. I mean, any of you who work with students, right? I mean, you would see that some students take the advice and you quickly know, improve. Some, you know, basically it becomes, as I say, don't sing to a pig, it, it uh, wastes your time and annoys the pig. That could happen, right? But for LLMs, I think they don't get annoyed, right? So I would be much easier to uh, do that. That's a very relevant question, and uh, thank you for asking. The questions? So I, I had a quick question, Ralph. So um, with some of these advances that you see LLMs supporting in the planning domain, uh, what applications do you think this would make possible? But in, in general, so one of the things that happen in regular algorithmic computer science is we tend to simplify the problem so that the algorithms are right. Right? Um, for example, as you know, I mean, even strict planning is essentially like a very simplified version of planning. Pretty much any planning is not even these days something. It's actually semi decided Right. So you would wind up in normal computer science thing has been that I would change the problem so that I can provide a practical algorithm. LLMs actually allow, they can guess plans for even more expressive domains. And with the expressive domains, with the plans that are suggested by LLMs, with a battery of critiques, trying to see if there's anything wrong from their domain of expertise in the plan, that's an entire architecture that opens up huge number of applications. Um, for which before people would change the problem just so that it would be actually So pretty much any kind of a you know mission planning or uh, and continuous quantity that that wind up requiring wind up your all of those can be handled in this sort of you know a single planner, a single guesser, and then a bunch of critiques. And the guesser essentially breaks the criticisms and maybe tries to get the next. Of course, one very interesting question is one of the things that you do have to understand is we have no idea how LLMs work other than that n-gram analogy, right? And so even when you give prompts to them, it's not very clear that they're actually, quote unquote, listening to your prompts. You know, some people believe that somehow they're instructing. I tend to think that, you know, my sister has a dog and she thinks her dog is very different from all other dogs and can understand full on sentences and paragraphs. And she talks to the dog in full sentences and paragraphs. And the question is, does the dog really understand all of it? My sister <laughs> says it does. <laughs> right? And so the question is the same for LLM. So when you give these prompts that you're pouring your heart out, right? You don't really know. I mean, we anthropomorphize the heck out of everything. In fact, the 101 AI joke that I tell intro to AI students is the following, which is um, an engineer and a mathematician and an AI guy got together and they're trying to figure out what's the greatest invention in the human civilization. And mathematician says, zero, of course. And engineer said, wheel, of course. And AI guy said, thermos flask, of course. And everybody's surprised, why thermos flask? 
said well if you pour cold water in it is it cold yeah or hot water in it is it hot yeah how does it know <laughs> you understand what i'm saying so we tend to anthropomorphize i mean it's a, it's a joke because we tend to anthropomorphize everything and llms are much closer to being anthropomorphized than even thermos flask that we are anthropomorphized okay so we should be particularly careful about the assumptions we make as to what actually is the reason something changed it's not necessarily because it quote and quote attended to its prompt. In fact, the bigger paper on the, um, the Kaya and uh, Matthew are involved. On, on the full paper, if you read on the graph coloring, uh, Kaya basically looks at how often does it even actually attend to the criticism currently versus globally. So one of the criticisms is once I give you this criticism, you should keep it in the global level. Oftentimes it doesn't even attend locally. And certainly it doesn't attend to it. And we are sort of using this great technology, which seems to do pretty interesting, unintuitive forms of prompt completion for other purposes. And the worst thing you can do is anthropomorphize. The best thing you can do is look at it for what it is and try to use it. Yes, sir. So uh, on following on what you just explained, uh, if LLMs are, from what we understand, is nothing more than an n-gram model with and being so high. So is it a realistic ex expectation for LLMs to do more than information retrieval? Like, isn't that? Uh, no, I mean, I think basically the under, that's that the word information retrieval that you're talking about, approximate uh, you know, retrieval is a very loaded thing. It is what that they do. They, anything else you want, you need to change the architecture. It cannot just be n-gram completion. And anytime you wind up saying, but it is able to do it, you have to check. The data. Remember the two, one, two, thirteen example for the cipher text. If you didn't hear this, this was by the way from a paper by Tom Griffith and Co. from Princeton. Um, if you didn't hear this, you know you would be very, you nobody will laugh at you if you are very surprised. Saying, wow, it can do. And by the way, I forgot to show this. There was this one particular example. Again, okay, science always goes in this thing. You know, first we are wondering, and first we are very impressed, and then we start looking at things that are wrong. That's what scientists do in the sense that we actually question our assumptions. That's the whole point of this, right? So one of the things that, that was going around, I wish I could show it to you with on Twitter, is there was this example of muffins and chihuahua dogs. And then basically early computer vision systems couldn't tell which is a muffin, which is a chihuahua dog. And so they would say the systems are not doing well. And then sometime recently, you know, chat GPT V, chat GPT vision could tell it correctly, 100%. Everybody has wow, noticed that on GPT-4, now chat GPT V is even, even more impressive. And then you know what somebody found? Essentially, if you change the order a little bit, it fails. What it did, it remembered because this particular test has been repeated enough number of times that it's become part of its memory because it's part of the collective memory, so it becomes part of the memory. It's the same exact 1 to 13 playing a game. Is that a bad thing? It's not necessarily a bad thing. If in fact you have infinite memory, you can avoid reasoning. I actually tell students that the whole point of civilization is that we don't, that even bozos can survive. Bozos like me can survive. I don't do first principles reasoning. I can just follow recipes. If I was like in the cave dwelling uh, era, I would be gone like the first thing, first person to go would be me, right? Now I can just follow everything because you guys, rest of us all stabilize the environment that if you follow some you know, recipes, you'll be fine. You know what the last people recently who had to actually use reasoning? Remember those Colombian kids who got dropped into the forest because their plane failed, the flight failed, right? There was no Google. And there was nothing that was standardized. They actually had to do first principles reasoning to survive before people found them miraculously after 40 years. That's how hard it is to actually come up with reasoning requirements when you have infinite amount of memory. And you guys already had infinite amount of memory because of the you know, civilization and because of Google. And ChatGPT basically is be just basically putting that in a sort of a n-gram model. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rao. Uh, that you. was a, a very exciting talk. So if we could thank uh, Rao for...
Okay. So uh, I just I do I sorry, I do want to say one thing if we are because there are students here. Um, so when I gave this talk yesterday for this 900 people, I was telling you lots of people are extremely excited. And there's this one lady who specifically came to me and said, if I if my professors were like this, I would never have missed a class. I don't know why my students once in a while miss a class. What's wrong with them? But that's <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> So um, we're going to take a break, but at 11 o'clock, the next session will start, and we are going into the parallel sessions. So in this room, uh, the topics will be actionable, actionable decision-making in the physical world, sense-making in human-centered uh, dynamic systems, and machine learning accelerator design. And then in room 222, which is right over that way, uh, Gia, could you uh, raise your hand, Gia? Yeah, so Gia will be leading a session, and the speakers will be describing uh, in the intelligent edge, so edge-based intelligence, interactive robot learning, and secure image generated AI. So on that note, uh, feel free to have some coffee and rejoin us at 11 in one of the two sessions. Okay, we're about to start the session. So, uh, would, you know, earlier today I mentioned that we uh, hired some really strong new faculty members, and I'm really uh, pleased to